hei, nyt on aika kolmannen ja viimeisen kiinut luennon. Se päättää tämän upean täyteläisen elämää ja kohtaamisia täynnä olleen ulos uut out tapahtuman. Ja luennon pitää meille professori Jean Plenkinsop. Nyt päästäisin hänet avaamaan tänne meille aihetta ekososiaalisen kulttuurin muutosta etsimässä. Kuusi periaatetta, jotka laittavat ulkoopetuksen muutoksen keskiöön. Now I let him take the stage and open us the topic in search of ecosocial cultural change. Six principles that put outdoor education right in the center. Ihanaa, kun olet täällä. Tervetuloa Jean Blenkinsop. It's so wonderful to have you here. Welcome, Jean Blenkinsop. Thank you. Uh, that was a little over the top. <laughs> I realize that one of the things is if you do lots of stuff, then like the amount of time you have to talk shrinks as the introductions grow. Um, so that works out really nicely for me. Um, I have to start first by saying thank you very much for inviting me. I'm honored to be here. It's, I guided my first whitewater canoe trip when I was 14 years old and I've only ever made a paycheck as an out door educator. Um, a lot of times it was a really small paycheck. I don't know if that's what happened in Finland, but in Canada they're really small. Anyway, um, I do have to say thank you to a bunch of people. Thank you to the organizers, thank you to Ulla, thank you to Anna. Anna and I have been working on this for a while. Thank you to the folks running the stage, thank you to Maya, thank you to Aria for responding. And there's another Aria, I think. I think there are two Arias I've been involved with. Um, I do want to note that I started to come up with a sort of research question related to all of these names. I'm going to test it right now. So all those of you who are Finnish, raise your hands. All right, hold them up, hold them up. All those of you whose first names end in a vowel, lower your hands. All right, so that's about 3%, 4%, maybe. Okay, on the other hand, all those of you, you can put your hands down now. All those of you who are not Finnish, raise your hands. Oh, look at that, there's like three of us. <laughs> all right, all those of you whose first name does not end in a vowel, leave your hands up. Look at that, 50%, 60%. Look, it's coming up. All right, anyway, I think there's money in this if somebody wants to write the research grant. Um, I have no idea why you have vowels at the end of your name. So, what am I going to do? I want to do a quick land acknowledgement and a little bit of kind of framing. I want to set up what I'm going to talk about because I'm actually going to ignore this six principles thing that Ula suggested because this is what it's like to work with Sean. I don't know if you have this when you're teaching, but I do this all the time to my students. I'm like, I had an idea. And they're all like, oh God, he's had an idea. What's going to happen? So I had an idea. We'll get at these principles, but we're going to get at them from a different kind of direction. I'm calling this talk the four C's, as in the letter C, of eco-social cultural change. Um, so we'll get to that in a second. I'm going to do a little bit of background just to set it up, because in fact, this is like the sequel talk, right? I did a talk two years ago back in Canada, sent it in. And that was a talk that was very much around relationship. And I set that one up as a sort of nature as, and dropped in sort of three, four different conversations, which I realized yesterday on the dock. That talk two years ago was nature as, and I said nature as community, nature as culture, nature as colonized, and then nature as co-teacher. So two years ago, I had four C's and didn't even realize it until last night. I was like, this is like the second talk I'm doing with four C's. I'm not sure why that is, just like I'm not sure why you all have vowels at the end of your names. But All right, so a little bit about the t-shirt, because it's up there too. I live on the traditional territory of the Squamish people. That's the blue down here, right, with the seven and the U. Um, it's unceded territory 
which in a Canadian conversation means that there was never any treaty signed and that the people who live there, the white settler people who live there, are there basically illegally. All right? That's really important to think about when you're doing this kind of work for us. And one of the traditions that's begun in Canada is to do something called a land acknowledgement. So I want to name that and put it out there. These other words are actually places in the territory that I live in. So you can spend your time like reading them and ignoring me if you want. I actually live in a place called Huisam, which means place of gathering shellfish. Um, so that Sam or Mesh tends to mean place of. All right? So these are place names in the language that grew from the place itself. All right? Um, so to play with my land acknowledgement, I want to name a sort of sense that I've had for the last three days being here with you and in this place. And this, I have this, it's been this intriguing sort of sense of both belonging and not belonging simultaneously. Right? Like I've been in outdoor education for a long time, so y'all are doing similar things, right? There's a slack line there. There are people like gathered up to debrief. I'm interested in why there are no hacky sacks, but in, in North America, hacky sacks are there all the time. Um, so there's a sense of belonging, but then, right, you also speak a language that I don't understand. Um, other than, for some, I was thinking about the Finnish words that I know, and they were all hockey players. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Jarko Rutu, Timo Solani, Sebastian I was like, that's all I know, um, which may just tell you something. And I'm a big fan of the Vancouver Canucks, and Atu Ratu is coming. He's going to be our third line center next year. Um, for those of you who really want to know. All right. So, a little bit of background just on the projects, because I think it's helpful. The other piece about the belonging piece is that, in fact, I grew up in Canada's northern boreal forest. So it's very, very, very similar to this forest. It's right, granite domes carved by glaciers, lots of sand in between pines and spruce and birch and poplars. Except, intriguingly, it doesn't quite fit, because the pines are different, the birches are different. Poplars are different, so there's a, this kind of sense of belonging and not belonging, all right? So that's my little land acknowledgement for you to open up the day. Um, what do I need to tell you? A little bit of background. So there are two projects I want to name. One, Ula mentioned, right, and that's this Maple Ridge Environmental School. About 15 years ago, one of my doctoral students, who was also a teacher in the district and a vice principal, came to me and said, Sean, we're troubled with the way public education is going, right? We feel like there's a justice conversation that needs to be had. We feel like there's an environmental conversation that needs to be had. And we feel like education, as it currently exists, isn't really doing good work in that kind of direction. And they came to me because I had been talking about cultural change, right? I come out of an environmental ed background. Right? And I've been doing it for a long time. Even 15 years ago, I'd been doing it for a long time. And I was hard pressed at a certain point in time to actually say, I've had some success. We've changed things. Like the best I could maybe say was, it's not as bad as it could have been if we weren't there as environmental eco educators. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Um, it's not a great thing to say in terms of your career, in terms of the work you're doing. And one of the critiques I started to develop at that point in time was that one of the challenges we were having in environmental and outdoor education was that we tended to think about changing one person at a time. So it's like, if I just spend time with you, get you to care for the forest, right, you'll go and change the world. Right? I just don't think it works that way. Right? I think that there's a problem built into, at this point in time, mainstream Canadian culture, at its sort of depth, at its heart. Right? that is actually unjust and probably environmentally problematic. Right? But that also means that that's built into public education. Because public education is about recapitulating the culture as it exists. Right? It's about bringing the next generation into the culture as it exists. Make sense following me? Okay. You can always ask questions. You can put up your hand. I'm totally fine with that. You can fall asleep if you want. You can lie down on the floor if the chairs are <laughs> shite. You can tell me to slow down if I get too excited, too. All right, so that's where we are. So Jody comes to me, Clayton comes to me, and they're like, what can we do? And I'm like, well, why don't we see if we can change culture through public education? My argument at that point in time was we needed to use a whole school. Because in the public education system, a whole school 
is in fact a kind of small cultural unit. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right? Because it's really hard if you're the one teacher. I don't know how many of you are like the one teacher trying to do something in a school. Is there anybody? Yeah, yeah, right? You close your door, you try not to let people see what's going on, right? That kind of thing. But then a bell goes off or the principal shows up or whatever, and you're like, ah, I'm trying to do something else. <laughs> right? So we decided to do a whole school. But if you're going to do cultural change, like when I say the word school, what appears in your mind? Usually what appears in people's mind is a building, a square building. Usually there's like a big square tacked on the side that's a gymnasium, right? There's some classrooms, there's a principal, there's bells, there's a field, yada, yada, yada. Is that what appears in most of your minds when you think about school? Yeah. So if you're wanting to change school, what happens if you put people into that same kind of building and say, oh, by the way, this is school, but we're doing school differently? <laughs> Hard to do. Right? Because all of the parents, all of the caregivers have been to school. They know what school looks like. They know how it works. Right? So we decided, I proposed, you should have seen this. This was one of the best meetings I've ever had in my life. Because I'm meeting with the superintendent. We're like, we're going to do a school. We're going to do a whole school. The superintendent's interested. Right? We're going to do this eco thing. We're going to think about justice. We're going to rethink education. And we want no building at all. <laughs> and she was like, come again? And then, I think, in a stroke of absolute genius, what I said was, it's cheaper. <laughs> and she was on it, but in really good political fashion. She did, this is, a, this is a stroke of genius on her part, she was like, okay, Sean, you can do this, but here's the deal. If it goes up in flames, falls apart, doesn't work, it's your fault. <laughs> and if it works and is really great, it's... My fault. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At least he was honest about it. All right. So anyway, does that make sense? Give you a sense of the school? Yeah. That's what's going on. There's a school without walls that has a mandate to try and change culture, right? Out of those kinds of things, and I talked a little bit about it in the last talk, but out of those kinds of things, nature as co-teacher started to appear. So what I want to do is I, I'll, that's... Project number one. Project number two is about two years ago, the Canadian government put out a call for researchers who wanted to work on kind of particular pressing issues in the Canadian populace. Most of them were like, I don't care. But one of them was, how do we live within the Earth's carrying capacity? And I'm not sure in Finland, but I'm guessing the numbers are similar. In Canada, if you normed the amount of consumption that happens in the normal Canadian situation across the globe, we would need four globes of resources, right? Now, there's some pretty serious justice issues built into that and also some mathematical difficulties, right? Um, so the argument was, how do we, as Canadians, figure out? So I think... If you'd read the grant and the way in which it was framed up, they were thinking, like, scientists come and tell us how to do this, right? How do we change this? How do we change the technology? How do we do the work? We wrote a grant, and what we said was, hang on a second. What you're talking about is you're talking about change. You're talking about potentially cultural change to go from four planets of use to less than one. And the interesting thing is, none of you have put education into this conversation. How do you move a population that's comfortable using four planets of resources to a population that only wants to use one planet of resources. To me, that's a massive educational conversation. Right? And often researchers and universities make a mistake. Poly scientists or philosophers will tell you what the world is supposed to look like, and then hopefully you read the book, and on Wednesday you're changed. <laughs> right? I don't think that's how it happens. So what I want to do is I want to name what I'm calling the four C's, right, of what it's like to be a teacher who's thinking about being involved in that project of moving from here to over here, where we're only using one planet. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And this will come out of the research. What I'm going to try and do is give you some stories, tell you some tales, fill it in. But I want you to do an activity first. All right, because I don't want to do all this work and I need a drink. What I want you to do is I want you to think about a tree. 
a tree that's been really significant in your life. All right? It could be the tree that's planted in your yard that you used to climb. It could be the fruit tree that was in your grandparents' backyard. It could be the tree that held you when you were sad and needed something to be held, to hold you. It could be the place that you were safe. Just a side note. This is one of the problems of being with me. Um, side note, there's a surprising number of my friends in the outdoor ed field for whom the natural world was, in fact, the safe place where they belonged. <laughs> They came out of human worlds that weren't safe, that were dangerous, that they didn't belong. All right. So has everybody got a tree? You're thinking about a tree? All right. What I want you to do is I want you to turn to somebody nearby you and introduce that tree to them. All right. But there's one more piece to this. I want you to introduce that tree as you think it, they would want to be known. Does that make sense, what I'm doing here? Right. If, that, if they don't want to be known to that other person, then don't introduce the tree to them. <laughs> All right? Does that make sense? So I'll give you a couple of minutes. Introduce that tree to the person next to you. Remember, how the tree would like to be known. All right, come on back to me. Thanks. Thank you very much for doing that. A couple of points that I wanted to make because this rolls me into the very first C. The first C is about human teacher as community builder. All right. I say human teacher because if you're talking about nature as co-teacher, you can't just say teacher and assume it's a human. All right? So this is human teacher as community builder. Remember, this is the project of eco-social cultural change. So what's this community building conversation? Building the community, teachers are really good at it. Outdoor educators, fantastic at it. Filling, facilitating space, allowing people to grow, holding that space, those kinds of things. Right? For us, what we started to realize really quickly was we had to think about community in a much broader sense. Right? You had to include the natural world, for one. Right? That meant wrestling with questions of what voice is in terms of the natural world. What rights the natural world might have. Right? Does the natural world have a right to not be known in the way in which you want to know it? Does that make sense, what I'm playing with there? All right. So that's a piece of the community building. And you're kind of always wrestling with the community building. It's also, and I think this plays into Irwin's conversation yesterday, right? It, there's a question about difference and diversity and how those things are honored and recognized as being important. How is spruce important to this community? Right? How is pollen or duckweed or anemones important to this conversation? 
and how does that voice function here? But another piece, a really, really practical piece, and for those of you who are wanting to try to do this, it's also about the process of educating the human community. Right? The kids actually figure it out the fastest, unsurprisingly. Right? But the parents, the caregivers, the community members, so we would have open houses, we would do this kind of stuff, we would work with them, we would bring them into the school. A lot of transparency, a lot of openness. It's actually pretty easy to be open and transparent when you have no, <laughs> no walls, right? Because the parents are just standing there talking and school is happening. So, but bringing them in, but also that process of thinking about and educating, right? Because if you're going to try to do eco-social cultural change, if you're going to do that kind of cultural change arc, then you can't just have a specific space where good things happen and kids are trying out new things or adults are trying out new things and then say, hey, go home. They don't know what you've experienced. They don't know how you've changed, all right? There's a kind of way in which you have to reach out. Here, I think outdoor educators have a ton to contribute. Most of the teacher, teachers, school teachers that I work with, they're not actually very good at facilitating beyond kind of the age group they're used to working with. So I think we have a ton to offer into that kind of cross facilitation, into opening up that space. Um, so that's the people ex education piece. What else do I want to tell you about? I won't tell you any more about that because I'm already running out of time. All right, number two, teacher as critical ally. Human teacher as critical ally. Quick story, well, relatively quick story. Um, school had opened. I now work with five different schools, but the first school, had open, doors were open, and we'd done a lot of reading. We knew the research, we'd done all this kind of stuff. And there's a guy named David Sobel, anybody heard that name? Pretty well-known kind of place-based educator. And he'd written a book about sort of allowing kids to have a time playing in the natural world. But playing in a natural world where they can build things. They build dens, they build forts, they build houses, they build whatever, right? His argument is that that's really useful. Kids try, get to sort of figure out who they are in the world. They play at being adults, right? It's a kind of identity thing going on, all that kind of stuff, right? And it builds relationship to the natural world. So we were like, great, we'll do some of that. And the kids at the school got about 40 minutes to an hour every single day to do this, right? And they built this amazing village Originally, they called it a fort, but that has all kinds of problematic connotations that we had to work through um, if you're in a Canadian context. Um, so the village, they build the village. Kids had these extraordinary lashing skills. There were like three-story things. There were like, it was an amazing sort of place. And then there was sort of imaginative play built into that. The kind of imaginative play that, is Penti Hakarainen still around doing imaginative play work here in Finland? Does anybody know that name? Oh, anyway, have a look at it. Um, but it's a kind of imaginative play where you as a teacher sort of mediate and get in. But it's an extended imaginative play, right? Remember, they're in the village every day for the entire school year. About three or four months in, we started to hear rumbles of some difficulties in the, in the village, right? Um, the village at this point in time, after three or four months, because we'd kind of been hands off, because there was this like, get kids into the environment, let them play, good things will happen, yada, 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 right? You're in. At this point in time, the village has one authoritarian leader who's like a grade seven boy, right? He has a posse of associates who help him to maintain order in the village, right? This includes having not one, not two, but three prisons in the village. Right? And a casino. I'm not really sure how that all fits together, but <laughs> there were three prisons in the casino. And there, were, there was an economic system connected to ropes and bits of wood for obvious reasons, right? This is like prime stuff, right? That was being hoarded by multiple people. And in fact, it was like Pokemon, natural Pokemon or something like that, right? Kids were paying like lunch money to get bits of rope so they could lash up their, their village. All right, are you getting the picture? So what was going on and what we started to interpret was that in fact kids in their imaginative play in the natural world were in fact recreating some of the kind of problematic cultural tropes, right? 
a particular kind of economic system, a power over, an individualization, a sort of resource-based extractive conversation going on, right? So it's like, oh, which this became a, like a really striking moment for us, this kind of realization that in fact, there's a sort of imaginative range that we have. We actually can't flex our imaginations all the way. Now, also interestingly, within the village itself, you had like smaller kids or different kids who had different imaginative ideas. They wanted to do different things. But of course, they spent most of their time in prison because you can't speak out against a man. Um, yeah, anyway, I want that to sink in a little bit because one of the tropes when I was doing all of that kind of environmental education was that in fact, all you need to do is stick them outdoors and good things will happen. And I'm not convinced. So this started to be, so teacher as critical ally, human teacher as critical ally is partially a conversation about being a mediator. How do you step in? How do you offer alternatives, right? Which also then means that we as teachers have to do some work. We have to figure out what the alternatives might be. Like what's a different kind of economic system that could be used? How, like what are we prioritizing, right? For us, this also started to be a conversation of teacher as activist. Teachers actually making decisions about how the world might want to be. The kind of world, in Martin Buber's terms, the kind of world you want to bring to your students. All right? And that meant that these teachers, the teachers we were working with, and they were all public school teachers. Of course, the school district and the superintendent wouldn't let me just hire anybody. Right? They had to be unionized within the school district. Right? So, <laughs> and they didn't even tell me who they were hiring until the day before. One guy showed up and he's like, I'm here because I love fishing. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, all right, so that's the, this teacher as activist conversation became part of this critical ally discussion where teachers have to start to think about whether or not they want to maintain the status quo, whether they want to be the neutral position. And I don't know if it happens in Finland, but in Canada, teachers see themselves as being neutral. The trouble with being neutral politically if you're doing environmental and social justice work is that neutral tends to be status quo, it tends to be the mainstream, it tends to be problematic in terms of social and environmental justice work. Does that make sense, are there any questions? All right, uh, do I need to tell you anything about that? Um, yeah, a little bit more, just around sort of ally and advocacy kind of work, right? So that's an activist kind of position, but there was also clearly a sort of move to do allyship. And one of the allyships I read in the last, in the last talk, um, it's totally binge-worthy, go back, have a look, have some popcorn. Um, I talk about a student named Raven, and Raven is this student who's talking to the world, and the world is talking to Raven. And in our encounters, I would argue, Raven was, in fact, literally talking to the world. And I read some quotes about, like, and the words curl into her mind, right? A, like, nine-year-old child naming this experience, right? Three years later, Raven is 12 years old, starting to enter adulthood, also starting to become part of the male gaze of a patriarchy, right, 12 years old, right? And Raven actually starts at this point in time, when she goes into public spaces, to turn to her mother and say, which Raven should I be, right? She's wondering if this is a space that's safe for her to be the kind of person that talks to trees. Right? for the kind of person who has that sort of relationality? Or is it an unsafe space for that person? Right? So in fact, at this point in time, Raven is doing a kind of classic psychic split. But she knows that there are these two different cultural ways of being in the world. And she knows that one is prioritized over another. Right? And for those of you who work with adults, this happens to me all the time. I'm like, go out, spend some time in a tree. I'm in an urban park, and they're like, that seems weird and creepy and odd. <laughs> Right. And my argument underneath all of those kind of responses, that seems weird, well the creepy one is a little different, but that seems weird, that seems odd, right? Is that what you're coming up against, you're coming up against the cultural norm, the sort of expectation, this is the way we're supposed to be. So in some ways this is the critical ally. Does that make sense, this kind of critical piece? And I think that's something that we as environmental educators, outdoor educators, have a kind of fairly good handle on, although I think there's still more work to be done. The lovely thing about this kind of work is that there's always still more work to be done. You're like, oh shit, I made a mistake there. Um, all right, how am I doing for time? Am I close? 
All right, I won't talk anymore about that. Critical ally. Does that make sense? Human teacher as critical ally. All right, next one. Human teacher as change agent or facilitator. I'm not really sure, but I'm going with change agent. Um, seems a little redundant to talk about eco-social cultural change and then name human teacher as change agent. But I think, I get back to the point that I had previously, that I think there's something important about seeing ourselves as being involved in the change, right? But there's also something about how do we create the space right, that allows the change to happen. Uh, what do I want to tell you about this? Oh, here, I got another activity for you. Uh, do I do have the time. I don't think I have the time. All right. Well, I'll get back to this activity if I can. So we started to think about change. Historically, change has tended to be thought about as being an individual thing, right? An individual makes this move, right? it becomes differently. But I've already talked about, well, that might not actually work. So it's starting to think about how do you facilitate change at an individual level, at a kind of community level, right? And then at a cultural level. What does it mean to kind of sort of make that space, to do that kind of work? Um, a couple of things that I think happen, and I think outdoor educators are really good at holding space and allowing for transformation to potentially happen. All right? But this means pushing back against sort of notions of time, notions of right, what's important, the, the kind of knowledge that we have to get through, those kinds of things. Like, what does it mean to create a space that allows your students to kind of experiment with who they are and, and what they are and how they be in the world? And this, how they be in the world, I think, has a really, is a really interesting kind of ontological question. Because right? one of the challenges, and this is the Raven kind of question, Raven is actually pointing at a different way of being in the world, right? a different way of being human. Right? Now that, for me, becomes this really interesting project. Like, what does it mean as a teacher to hold the space that allows folks to experiment into being human differently. All right. And one of the things that appeared for us when we were doing this eco-social cultural change work, which was a ton of interviews and a ton of literature reviews, was that we have a lot of really good allies and there's a lot of really good education going on in this how to be human differently. All right. Critical race education, LGBTQ education, feminist education. There's some really rich work going on in there that I think we could really learn from and help us and add, in some ways, add to a list of allies that includes right, how to be human differently in the natural world, how to bring that in. Does that make sense, what I've done there? All right, how am I doing, time? Okay, almost done, sorry. Uh, human teacher, this is the last one, number four, human teacher as care, cœur, nurturer, all right? There was a ton of debate amongst us about this one, right? Because everybody just wanted care. Right? They were like, care's enough, Sean, you're a lunatic. And I was like, I like care, but I actually, it makes me a little nervous, right? And the reason it makes me a little nervous is actually because of Nell Noddings. It does, have, have you come across sort of care education, care in schools, care ethics, those kinds of things? There's a famous philosopher, a famous feminist philosopher named Nell Noddings, who's done a ton of work for, in care in schools, right? And she tends to focus, A, on humans, so it's anthropocentric, right? So she actually says, and Nell, she passed away a few years ago, but she knows, because she and I would argue about this, she actually says that you can't be in a caring relationship with the natural world because the natural world doesn't know it's being cared for. All right? Should I repeat that or does that make sense? You can't be in a caring relationship with the natural world because the natural world doesn't know it's being cared for. Right? So for Nell, there has to be some, some anthropocentric, anthropomorphic reciprocity of some kind. Right? Now, the fact that the strawberry plant offers you a strawberry and that feels fantastic, right, is not understood as being care, all right? My argument always with Nell was, look, okay, there's no caring relationship, if I accept that, which I don't. But if I did, the problem is actually not on nature's side, it's actually the problem is on the human side, right? Then in fact, the human doesn't know that it's being cared for by the natural world, all right? So that was my trouble with care. 
So I wanted to add cur because love doesn't start with a C. Um, yeah, that's really the reason, because love doesn't start with a C. Um, but care is the French word for heart. And I thought that was kind of an interesting way to sort of add a notion of heart into the mix. Um, and when we think about character, when we were thinking about character, um, we thought about things like trauma. We thought about things like transformation. We thought about things like time. And it, a quick piece on the trauma conversation, I don't know if it's happening in Finland, but in Canada, right? They're just, public schools are just starting to think about what they call trauma-informed teaching. Is that happening here at all? Trauma-informed teaching? Yeah, and it tends, it tends to be focused on, like, in this room. We've got people who have trauma, who have had trauma, right? Just like in your classrooms, right? In any group, right? So what does it mean to teach in a way that you're not triggering that, in the way in which you're not growing that, in the way in which you're not doing those kinds of things? But in our research at the schools, we started to come across another kind of trauma, particularly exhibited by parents and caregivers. Any guesses on what this trauma might be? Nobody? Many of the parents and caregivers coming to our school had been traumatized by their public schooling experience, particularly high school. All right. Now, I wanted that to just sit with you for a second. Right? As an educator, how does it feel to think about the work that you're doing is potentially traumatizing? Right? Now, getting back to human teachers, community builder, that kind of knowledge, even for some of those folks, didn't come out until five, six, seven years into the project, into that building of a relationship that allowed for that kind of space. Right? But I just want to posit that there. I also want on the other side of the conversation, connected to care care, I want to talk about celebration and gratitude and reciprocity. These became clearly really, really important things to all of the schools we work with. Right? Robin Wall Kimmerer's work around gratitude, gratitude to the natural world, right? The honorable harvest becomes a kind of way of thinking into teaching. What does it mean to just take what you possibly need to recognize what's useful to care for that, and then to give back. At one of the schools I work with, they actually, as part of their assessment, it's kind of weird and ironic, but as part of their assessment, part of the conversation is around student reciprocity. What have you done? What kind of actions did you do that were helpful to your school community, to your larger community, to the natural world? How is that part of what you're doing? Towards something that we call Mutually beneficial flourishing, that sort of direction. All right? One last little tiny story, because I'm actually really hopeful. And I wasn't 15 years ago. I was really depressed 15 years ago. I'm like, we're in a mess. This is not going to fix. So this happened this last fall at the Maple Ridge Environmental School, witnessed by one of our researchers. There are two boys. They're grade six. Um, <laughs> they weren't part of the posse in the village. Um, but they're sitting talking about the river, because one of the sites, Maple Ridge switches sites. It spends an, a month outdoors in various sites, partially to reduce impact and partially to sort of maintain relationship, but also to be in different places, because the different teaching affordances appear in these different places. Nature as co-teacher is different in different places. Anyway, the river, they're always there in the fall, because that's when the salmon come back. And we have, on the west coast, we have five species of salmon that come back. In this river, there are two that kind of classically come back. But the this summer was really, really dry. Rivers are really low. Water is really warm. That's actually affecting fry quite dramatically. Right? Um, and the boys are sitting there. They've been there for six, now seven years, and seen the salmon come back. And, there's all kinds of pedagogical curricular stuff that goes on around the salmon, right? <laughs> There's some boys who just show up in hip waders at, like, at the beginning of September and wear the hip waders until the end of October. They're just like... <laughs> they're in the river the entire time. I have no idea what that does to their... Uh, but anyway. Um, so 
the boys are sitting and they're talking and they're like, we don't see the salmon. The salmon aren't coming back. This is a little worrisome. And then one of the boys turns to the other and says, you know, if the salmon don't come back, that means that orca can't be orca anymore. And the other boy is like, huh. You know what that also means? That also means that Kwantlen can't be Kwantlen anymore. All right? Now, Kwantlen is the First Nations community where that is the First Nations community where that school is. Right? That's their territory. And the boys at this point in time know that salmon is not just food for Kwantlen. Salmon is the spiritual heart of the Kwantlen community. Salmon is brothers and sisters, is all my relations to the Kwantlen community. And if you pull salmon out of that reality, you lose Kwantlen. You lose a language, you lose a way of being, right? You lose a relationship to the earth, you lose all those kinds of things. And those grade six boys know that, but they also feel that. Right? So I will stop there. Should I mic drop? All right, thanks. <laughs>